welcome back everyone to Transrational Perspectives. My name is Noah Taylor. And my name is Sean Bryant. Uh, I'm from Canada. I'm joining you from South Korea and I have a PhD in Peace, Conflict and Development Studies. This is our fourth episode of Transrational Perspectives. In our previous episode, we discussed the, some of the origins of peace and conflict studies and the emergence of what has been called the transrational shift in peace and conflict studies, which has, deconstructs the notion of one singular idea of peace and uh, expands the playing field, so to speak, to, to have a way of addressing many different understandings of peace. In this episode today, we're going to be looking primarily at the energetic understanding of peace. Yeah, so at the end of the last uh, episode discussion, we were uh, talking about these uh, the theory of the many uh, pieces um, and this theory of families of pieces. And one of the uh, one of the system of categorizing of these families of pieces is as um, transrational family, postmodern family. Uh, modern family, moral family, and an energetic family of pieces. So uh, we're going to talk today about the energetic family of pieces, and we're going to touch on the some of the key defining characteristics of energetic um, approaches to peace. So the they are going to be that uh, energetic approaches understand. Um, uh, not just peace, but all of life as a manifestation of a of an all one um, um, cosmic divine force. Um, they understand human beings as an imminent part of nature. Um, they uh, are characterized by a nonlinear or circular conception of time, and see peace as emerging not only out of our interpersonal relationships, but also out of our place in the larger cosmos. So with the spirits or the ancestors or the, um, or heaven, as well as our interpersonal uh, relationships on earth. So from those topics, uh, we'll start by expanding a little bit on the first one of the, um, the understanding of of human beings as well as all of the existence as a manifestation of one singular sort of originary um, energy or divine force. Uh, do you have a, a good uh, an example of that? Well, well, I think uh, that yeah. that the out of the world of religion and culture. Yes, <laughs> I think that the the energetic understanding of, of peace it, it pre presupposes. A, a world that has nothing outside of it. And that, what that means is that it's a world entirely defined by relationships between individuals, but as you said, also between um, things that we may not consider in our modern mindset as being individuals. So our relationship to, to the spirits of nature, our relationship to our, the ancestors um, or other cosmic forces. And here I think we see understandings of peace that are closer to um, what is understood as Brahman in, in Hinduism, which is a, 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 the, the most expansive point of existence. It is the, the, the Godhead that embraces all of creation, or a, a similar understanding that exists in, in the idea of the Tao, which oh, is, yeah. is the, the, the Tao is the the relational force which causes some things to undergo the formality of actually occurring to happen in the space where anything can occur to happen. And in this, this is also, if we think of peace in this energetic way, it's deeply tied into the notion of fertility, into the notion mm -hmm. of, of, of creation. And that's why, as you, as you mentioned in our, our previous episode, that so many words, especially in um, West o Western Indo-European languages, if you trace their origin back, you eventually end up with the name of a, a fertility goddess. And that for, I would venture to say, the the longer span of human history, our notions of, pe of peace have been um, deeply interwoven with understandings of fertility. 
Yeah, which which uh, makes sense in the sense that that if if I uh, from a certain point of view, right, mm-hmm. uh, and that if, if I am doing what I what I what I can to have myself uh, my my internal world in order, mm-hmm. so it'd be at, at peace with myself and having harmonious relationships with uh, those people around me. Um, that this is also going to uh, influence the uh, my relationship with with the 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 land and the and the and the cosmos around me, and then the 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 earth will uh, produce, and if the the more fertile the the earth is, the the the, the more uh, food we have, and and then therefore the the pros- the more prosperous our our own lives and and community can be and and when we look at understanding peace out of harmony it's very deeply tied to the idea of balance and balance of course is this idea of uh, bringing together opposites you know whether that's mm-hmm. light and dark male and female existing and non-existing um and also energy and form. And this uh-huh. is where we get into a lot of uh, mystical understandings or tantric understandings of, of peace as the experience of the unification of, of opposites. And this is, this is also why I think that the energetic conceptions of peace are, exist in a, a nonlinear or a circular understanding of time also. Uh-huh. Because if if peace is defined as unification, then um, it's very difficult to see it as a as a chronological movement. Mm-hmm. And I think on that i uh, that idea, I think there's an important point of of the 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 of energetic. I, I would say the energetic perspectives in general can be very difficult for uh, people to understand who come from. A, especially a modern secular background, but that of also uh, one that's strongly influenced by the Western philosophical movements, mm-hmm. because this idea of this the sublation of dualities, of the the, the famous uh, Taoist symbol of the yin and yang, mm-hmm. um, that that the yin contains a drop of the yang. And and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So that if you think you can picture the 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 circle, then there's a little white dot in the black part, and there's a little black mm-hmm. dot. The saying that not only it, not, if you take sort of obvious um, uh, dualities of that of the night and day. Well, night is not the absence or opposite of day, but uh, the night contains the day as well as the day containing the night. Which is the the opposite of of the logical paradigm, the sort of Aristotelian uh, um, logic that said that well they have to be mutually exclusive. That if day is defined as not being mm-hmm. night and night is defined as not being day, then never the twain shall meet. Rather than say well they actually embody each other mm. and they contain they contain the seeds of each other within themselves. And and I, what I've, what is always what I have always found interesting about the energetic perspective is that I think that I'm going to make a huge generalization, but I think that <laughs> for for most people, their experience of peace outside of being in really physical danger um, is is more closely related to an energetic understanding. The felt feeling of peace is probably for m- many people much more related to the experience of balance whereas for at least the western mind the understanding of peace is probably for most people more oriented towards the absence of violence oh yeah i couldn't agree more i mean i think that's a, i think this is one of the major like uh breakdowns that that happens in and and for which a transrational perspective is really useful because I think that exactly like as you're saying, most people like intuitively understand this idea of of an energetic experience of of peace, of feeling mm. tranquil, of feeling in harmony, feeling 
feeling also in in harm in like a harmonious relations to the intangible um say spirits or forces of their surroundings mm. and say oh you know that they like, like uh uh, Wolfgang Dietrich in his in his book uses the metaphor of the still mountain lake. It's like, yeah, I, I I felt this profound sense of peace, and yet, how do you square that with then this question of of peace as this uh, security and justice and this this absence of war, and um, and so like if you ask me well what's your what's your definition of peace i might say well it's it's you know that feeling of tranquility the mm. the still mountain lake and well what is what is peace and then not just peace for me but to say define peace then i might say it almost in the same breath well peace is the absence of war and peace is like a you know the the blue helmets <laughs> a, yeah. interpositioning between two armies yeah and um, yeah, because I've got. I don't want to go too far off on this tangent, but then the bringing it back to this question of a, a transrational understanding. Well, I can, I can, I can square that, or I can come up with a uh, a useful synthesis and to say that well, they are internal and external experiences of this sort of same with larger phenomenon. And I think. What's also interesting to to point out is that the an energetic piece is a dynamic one. You'll mm-hmm. you'll never reach uh, a point of, of forever balance where the the system will stay forever. The in perpetual that, harmony. In the perpetual <laughs> harmony. And I I think that um, if 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 you were to think about personal experiences of harmony, and I was just now thinking about mm-hmm. some of the new research on, on flow states of consciousness mm-hmm. and um, what I think neurologists are now calling ecstasis, which mm-hmm. are the, the moments where, you know, however you achieve the state of consciousness, whether it's it's um, through engaging in, in your, a martial art or yoga or running or extreme sports, that when you- a dedicated en- meditation practice. Yes. <laughs> You and you enter into the a space of, of harmony within yourself, but also with the world around you. You really end mm-hmm. up in this 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 space where at least everything feels like uh, synchronicity. Mm-hmm. Connections flow easily. Um, the, the there's a sense of ease towards your your relationship with the world, but there is also a, a, an interesting thing that happens with the sense of time, which is reflecting mm-hmm. you know the theoretical understanding of energetic uh, peace is that it's not a linear concept of time. But I think that if you recall any flow experience of consciousness, that you also have this kind of collapsing of the future vision of time. The, you, it's the perpetual mm. now of the present moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, that reminds me of two things. One, talking about the idea of the harmony or the perpetual harmony, is it reminds me that, that you and I even uh, published a joint paper with Florencia mm-hmm. and Catalina talking about a musical metaphor mm-hmm. of harmony and so you know if you have this um perfect harmony um let's say you know three notes and a major triad yeah. i mean that's that's beautiful but it doesn't make good music i mm. mean it's very very boring music <laughs> yes. if you have that pretend that perfect harmony forever right and what makes interesting music is the 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 shifting of that from um, a starting point to creating harmony to creating dissonance to then resolving back to harmony mm-hmm. and uh, and continuing this uh, pattern both in expected and unexpected ways and that makes beautiful music so it's not it's not the the perfect harmony but in fact the 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 moments of harmony in um, that that come um, out of these moments of tension that is so create some of the most beautiful uh, moments in a, a musical piece. Uh, on the idea of the the like this nonlinear or, or circular uh, concept of time, one of the the examples that has made the most sense for me was uh, about um, the Iroquois in North America. I read about it in. Um, in David Graeber's book, I believe it was in Debt, the first 5,000 years that he writes about it, and said that the traditional Iroquois villages were just divided into two halves. And 
um, it was the responsibility of each half to bury the dead of the other half. Mm. And, and so um, there's an idea that nobody had to take, uh, keep track of, mm -hmm. let's say, how many people were dying on one side right. or the other because if you, if you assume that, the, that there's always going to be a village, right, that, mm. that your, your humankind will continue, mm -hmm. uh, then there will always be, there will always be this time to reciprocate because there will always be new people being um, born and dying on each side of the, on the village and that, that it's, it's this, this ongoing um, process. And then another extrapolation of that is that our, our lives and aren't our own in the sense that we are intergenerational beings. And so this, uh, then this idea of me as an individual um, um, dissolves into this idea of like a, a greater um, uh, community. And of myself as also being an, an intergenerational being, is that where, where I stop and, and my offspring begin is not necessarily so clear, uh, especially uh, uh, for women, when the, the, this being emerges from their body. Mm -hmm. and this is, uh, John Paul Lederach calls this the 200-year the now, Yes. Where you imagine ten generations um, in each each way forward and backwards in time, and he um, I think he suggests this notion as a a way as a as a mode of ethics for for considering about how how you make your your ethical choices is that you consider each choice in a moment as being contextualized in this two hundred year now mm -hmm. both gener both ways both honoring your ancestors, but also honoring um, mm -hmm. your, your future, the future generations that, that mm -hmm. will come to pass. And saying that, that most people's experience is uh, knowing their grandparents right. and then knowing their, their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And it's an ideal time of, of life lifespan. And that, uh, so that you're shaped by people that were born like a like hundred years before you and then um, by the time your grandchildren die, it could be another hundred years past past your life. So it's creating this sort of two hundred year present moment. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. I think one of the things that is in the background of what we're talking about is that what what conflict then looks like in an, from an energetic perspective is is the the blockage of this dynamic movement. Mm -hmm. And that the if peace in an energetic sense is understood as balance and harmony, then like what peace work looks like is is trying to remove the blockages that are inhibiting that that, that relational flow of energy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I take from energetic perspectives is one of the worst things you can do is refuse to relate. Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, and that also, also is therefore one of the worst punishments too. Is if you're like if you're not in harmony with the group, yeah. you're in exile. You know, you're kick, you're voted off the island. Yeah. <laughs> in the uh, yeah. Well, I think that's why in terms why, of survivor. Sh why shunning and and exile have been punishments since you know the the earliest recorded religious texts. Oh, exactly, and it makes a lot of sense in in uh, our natural um, sort of emotional re, um, reactions of, of, of shame, you know, if we're, if we're uh, because I think that that's the, the, the mechanism to try and make amends, so that if we are connected to our community, and then we're shunned, we'll feel shame, mm -hmm. and then if we feel shame, we'll say, well, I want to rejoin the collective, I want to rejoin my, my brothers and sisters and take my place in the community, and so then I'm motivated to, to make to make amends and then where it goes where it goes off the rails if for, for whatever reason i don't feel shame or i'm too proud to mm -hmm. uh to 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 submit myself uh, to make those changes well then i'll go off and and do something else and 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 uh, maybe wallow in my <laughs> in my uh, in my pain and then plot revenge and i think that that's where we, uh, 
I think we get like a lot of like um, uh, stories from from that kind of uh, from the, those kinds of situations. And you know that to me that really just touches again back to our episode yesterday or the last episode rather was the the expansive nature of peace and conflict studies because the if we wanted to look into the the mechanisms by which uh, cultures and societies reestablish that balance or remove the blockages. Mm-hmm. Um, we we could go into looking at the the phenomenon of the scapegoat. We yeah, could go looking exactly. into how shame works in society and how um, modes of exclusion and inclusion work in terms of uh, sociological organization or religious mm-hmm. conception. And I think that both shows the the range of tools and perspectives in peace and conflict studies and also the the main challenge is its inherent complexity because mm-hmm. at, at some point it deals with all all of human existence and mm-hmm. all of our realms of knowledge and action and so mm-hmm. then the you know the real task or i think part of this skill and the art and the science of, of the approach of doing peace work um, in this way is is knowing the is knowing and feeling which which tools and which perspectives um, are the most skillful to to use in a given moment or a given episode mm-hmm. of conflict. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just wanted to come back to the the some of the the ma- main characteristics of an energetic perspectives just to make sure that we we hit all the main points mm-hmm. we wanted to discuss in this time. Um, the uh, I wanted to just contrast the idea of of human beings as being like an imminent part of the natural world with uh, how they can be seen in from other perspectives uh, to, to kind of give it a bit more mm-hmm. uh, context um, because I th- I think uh, um, say a, a moral perspective might see. Uh, human beings as, as being separate or stewards of the of the natural world, so not necessarily a part of the of the natural world, mm-hmm. like a, as a part of nature, but as uh, a preferred cre- creation. Mm-hmm. So like in in the, the this can be really summed up by one of the the lines in the book of Genesis, so saying you know, you're going to go forth and and subdue the 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 world. I mean mm-hmm. it's, it's it's yours for the taking, and and you have to be a steward to look after it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's like a modern um, a modern understanding as well, like the clockwork. It's like the rocks are dead, the streams are just mm-hmm. it's just H two O, you know. Mm-hmm. It, the, you can understand it like a chemical flint, so it's not like the spirit of the river or the or the river is our mother or the forest is a like, living thing. Like trees are fiber; it's a commodity. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the mountains are just piles of rocks, and it's not worth a damn thing until you turn it into steel and sell it. And um, uh, and then, like um, in postmodern perspectives, you say, well, maybe those the the, the what matters is our interpersonal relationships. So, if those are in harmony, then that's important, but not necessarily the side, the idea of of the human being in relation to the the sort of spirits of the stones and and trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other currents of in within postmodernism, say environmentalism. Well, say that that yes, um, protecting the environment is is important, but as a as an instrument to or like towards modernity in mm-hmm. the sense of like well uh you preserve the environment because um we quantify about all the ways in which it is it is good for us it you know, prevents soil erosion and puts nutrients back in the soil mm-hmm. um you know eco ecotourism is good for business it's good for the economy mm-hmm. um so uh protection is like protection of the environment not as just an inherent um, good because it's alive and in, and inextricably connected to our own existence, but protection of the environment as um, as an instrument of some other um, um, modern understandings. And and I think you know the way that I would understand that is it's 
it's an energetic perspective is really balance for its own sake. It's not for like balance is not good because it's ordained by a deity. It's not good because it's profitable. It it is um, a natural function of of a living creature, and it's also the source of fertility and the, mm-hmm. the source of our ongoing ability to exist rather than not exist. Right. And I got to go back to my kind of ran, rambling description <laughs> of like the fertility process. It's like, like, yeah, that that was actually the point I was getting to. It's like, well, it, it's for its own sake. Is like, well, if you want to live, right? <laughs> if, you right. Want, if you want the if you want the crops to grow, uh, you know, like, you know, I've heard this said, but it's it only makes it only starting to make more sense the more I understand really like energetic perspective. Is like saying like, well, if you want you treat the land well, the land will treat you well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was in, um, I think it was in, in Transrational Resonances, the, the, the book of Sylvester Valk's uh, chapter about holotropic breathwork, and he uses this uh, rather, I think, a famous little anecdote about the rainmaker. And he says, well, I can't make it rain, but but it rained. Well, what I did was I may put myself in, in harmony, and I sent mm-hmm. you back to work, and putting you back to work um, sort of harmonized relationships in the village, and then when everything was in harmony in the village, and the rain came, right? Mm-hmm. So there's the same idea of the human being being this conduit between heaven and earth, and keeping the heaven and keeping all three in balance, and 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 you know I I can imagine like uh, meteorologists and <laughs> like and environmental sciences say this was total bullshit. Uh, <laughs> But, but from these principles of an of energetic perspectives and of 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 resonance and homeostasis and correspondence, uh, the the macrocosm or the macrocosm reflecting the microcosm, um, the these things make perfect sense. And I think that for the the thing that the, we should keep our keep uh, the perspective on is that these things are especially they're especially important, especially useful. In saying, well, if we're looking at how people in the world actually interpret their world, this is a way that a lot of people in the world function. Yeah, both have functioned in the past, but also are currently perceiving and, currently ex- yeah, and experiencing yeah. and experiencing the world and experiencing peace or the lack of peace. Mm-hmm. And so, the, so me as as a as a if I'm thinking of myself as a peace and conflict worker and who's might be hired by a client to 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 intervene and try to uh, 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 try to help people find <laughs> find peace in their lives if I'm in a context in which this is a, a, a way of being this is a part of their their ontology mm-hmm. and the understanding of how the world works well then I I'm being negligent if I'm not taking that information and acting appropriately if I'm if that's if that's the situation I find myself in, where uh, people see themselves as 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 this, uh, and are needing to harmonize the relations between heaven and earth, and I'm talking about human rights and and uh, some sort of criminal courts in the Hague or something, <laughs> that uh, I'm not going to be speaking a language that that connects with the with the blockages in the system. And and I think that this is going to be a really uh, core point as we move forward and discuss the the other peace families is what 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 happens when these different understandings come up against each other. So mm-hmm. so if if there is a indigenous community that has is living in a forest and sees it as a, a living a living soul in itself. And it's a, there's a conflict with a, a logging company who sees mm-hmm. the pure commodity of the forest. How mm-hmm. do you how do you translate back and forth between these different areas? I think this is going to be a, a, a key question that we're going to come back to over and over totally. how we manage this. And and that that's such a it, that is like a really important contemporary question, and I think in in many parts of the world. All right, so I think that... <laughs> <laughs> on that, yeah, on that note, on, let's on, wrap it up for today. 
So thank you for, for joining us today on Trans Rational Perspectives. And please join us next time where we'll continue this discussion and we will look at the moral understanding of, of peace. Bye-bye.